This is Public Resource. The Internet Code Improvement Commission. This is Carl Malamud. We're talking with Ed Walters, who is the founder and CEO of FastCase and is also a longtime member of the Board of Directors of Public Resource. Ed, welcome. Great to be here, Carl. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, So FastCase provides codes, regulations to all 50 state bars. You also provide them to public resource, which we purchase, but then we open source them. Uh, We've got them up at Cornell and over at Justia and other places. How do you get those regulations? Well, uh, it's a it's an arduous process. It's terrible, actually. In most cases, the way FastCase gets the law is we visit uh, public sites, um, a state legislature or an agency um, or a secretary of state will put these things online. Um, but they're in a million different formats or no format at all. Uh, there's no consistency among them. There's no consistency even within them, like the same state year to year won't publish in the same format. There's a million errors. Um, in, in many cases, you know, the, the regulations or the statutes have drafted somewhere else and then they are ported to HTML. Uh, for display online, it's a mess. I mean, in some of the cases, the state regulations are in image PDFs, right? And so what what our team does is we collect these things on a daily basis uh, in a million different formats. We standardize and harmonize and you know put them into a format that people can use, right? And the same the same format using the same standards uh, that everyone can read across. Um, I make it sound pretty easy. It's really, really hard. <laughs> um, it's it's needlessly hard in many cases. You used to do this in China, right? Yep. Um, and we still do some of it in China. We do some of it uh, in India. We do some of it in the U.S. We have different data vendors like all around the world who help in this process. When you say it's different formats, is this a bulk download from each state and you get a zip file or do you have to go crawl some website? What formats it in? Yeah, it's it's really it's it's crazy. It's um it's it's kind of unbelievable in a way. If someone had told me at the beginning of this process 22 years ago when we started FastCase uh, that this was going to be how we would acquire the law, I frankly wouldn't have believed them. So it's it's really truly different in every state. Uh, it is not like one process that's applied to regulations. Um, and so, in some cases, we actually take um, the entire enrolled regulations in book form and triple key it. Uh, we actually type in all the pages, or in some cases, OCR scan them. Um, in the case of Vermont regulations, we actually had to type them in because the OCRs. It wouldn't work on image PDFs. They're not text PDFs. And so for every state, there's a whole different process that we have to go through to convert uh, locked up versions of regulations or statutes uh, into useful, clueful, structured data formats. And even there, there's a, there's so much work to do. Like our, our team is you know, really just doing the the base level of this. I know the public resource uh, universe, uh, the public resource constellation of friends and uh, vendors and, uh, you know, people who help improve these codes, the Code Improvement uh, Commission um, uh, works to add like a whole bunch of useful information on top of the very base layer that FastCase does. Surely they have a database that these things are kept in, right? Do they use vendors, these states that do the regs? I know for legislative codes, they do. For regulations, do they do it themselves or do they have vendors? You know, I can imagine that in it's different in every state, right? I, I hope that in many cases there is a central database somewhere, but I don't think that's always true. So, for example, when FastCase merged with uh, CaseMaker um, in the end of 2020, CaseMaker was one of the vendors for the Georgia rules and regulations. And so we have, you know, now by combining with Casemaker, we have sort of inherited that work. And we are, you know, sort of working with the Georgia Secretary of State to make those regulations, um, you know, smarter and more public and more available and, you know, more out in the open. Um, So uh, I'll just say like in the the case of Georgia, uh, we are sort of keeping the centralized database of those regulations. 
Um, there's no there's no one inside of Georgia in the Georgia government who has like that kind of centralized database. By the way, I hope to change that. I hope that we can, you know, uh, in our case, working with Georgia, give them a copy so they can have like that kind of central point of truth. But then also, I hope that uh, you and I working together can go to California, Idaho, Mississippi, and say, here are your regulations in structured data formats. You don't have to be holden, uh, be beholden to outside vendors to own this, to publish it, to improve it, to work with it. Um, you know, there's, uh, I think that in many cases, states uh, don't have the budget or don't feel like they have the expertise to do this transformation. Uh, but I think if we can make that first step lower for them uh, to give them structured data, I think there's a world of difference they can make inside their own states with their processes. You always crawl sites, it sounds like. Have you ever asked the states for their underlying database? Have you gone to them and knocked on the door, either informally or using a Public Records Act request? We never have. We haven't. Uh, we have not done that in the past. Um, you know, we we occasionally um, will ask like a, a vendor or something, but the you know vendors aren't super excited about making this stuff uh, public or freely available. I'll just say something about this. You know, when when FastCase got started, uh, one of the things that we were one of the problems we were trying to solve is what I will call the mere access problem. The business model of publishers was mere access to judicial opinions, mere access to regulations. You know, if you wanted to get the document itself, you had to subscribe to a you know software service. And I think one one thing that you know, FastCase is a for-profit company, and I know uh, public resources and nonprofit share in common, is the idea that we have to move past this mere access subscription model. Mere access to the law should be a common understanding, something that everyone has in common. And if people want to improve it, if they want to add citation analysis or secondary expert commentary, if they want to create special lookup tables or derivative works of the law, you know, by all means, do that. It's an industry that could use some sophistication there. Um, but the the underlying law itself should be free for everyone in common, structured, easy to understand formats so that we can have this kind of innovation. By mirror access, you mean that you have a subscription service that has terms of use that are essentially allowing you to rent the law temporarily, but not download it, repost it or anything useful, any things like that. Yeah, I, I think uh, even simpler. Uh, the idea is that, you know, as as public resource uh, has established in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, you know, law, public law can't be owned by private companies. And it shouldn't be the case that any public law should be accessible only by subscription from a private company, right? There should be an open body of law that is, is accessible to everyone uh, and without subscription, right? And so this is this is really the difference. You and I have talked about this a number of times between free and open. Like you can visit a vendor's website uh, for many states and access the regulations subject to a terms of service, subject to a terms of use, agreeing that you will never under any circumstances republish the law or do anything with it. Um, and you know, those sites are free. I mean, you can you can go visit the law on those sites as long as you don't want to use the law. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a uh, uh, read-only law. I see, I see. You mentioned that there are errors in many of these regulations and codes. What kinds of errors are you talking about? Yeah, so I, I, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of them are transformation errors. So it will be things like in the in the text of the statute, uh, the numbering will be L two three. You know, instead of the character one, because the one in uh, courier and many other typefaces looks exactly like a one, it'll be translated into a lowercase L, and and that's in the you know the text of the law itself in the official codes in many cases, right? And so uh, you'll see that error. Or you'll see like there are places where 
of the enrollers or the codifiers or the people who, you know, uh, compile the regulations uh, from registers will put uh, the errors in numbering sequences. It'll go one, two, two, three, instead of one, two, three, four. Do you change that or leave it the way it is? We leave it the way it is. But uh, one thing that I think uh, our, our collective work could do uh, is to find the errors and just log them, you know, so the states can correct them. So uh, it would be it would be really great if there were kind of like a GitHub repo of errors in numbering or where there's obviously like a, a misspelled word or something uh, in the original, in the official, that we could say like, you know, with uh, many eyes, all bugs are shallow. Uh, if we can get the the cortex in front of many people, I think we could have like a national debugging commission to correct errors in our codes uh, in a way that saves states money, right? All, all states want to do this. The public servants uh, in state governments uh, and the federal government who uh, do this codification work are very, very serious about their work. They're committed to it. They care about it passionately. Um, and I think if we could help them to find errors that they don't know exist, they would be passionate about correcting them. Have you tried to push those errors upstream when your your team that's preparing the XML for these regs finds something that's wrong? Do you call the Secretary of State's office and say, look, in Title 14, you've got an L instead of a 1? <laughs> yeah, no, we haven't done that yet. That might be um, uh, something we should do, probably. I think maybe that's something that we can work on together. It would be, it would be great to be able to say to a state, um, you know, we're certifying your code as error free. Or, you know, we found the following three things that you might want to check. Maybe they're not even errors. Maybe you do this intentionally. But if you don't, you know, we will we'll do like a, you know, a free nonprofit audit that will take a look at it, and, you know, for free, make some suggestions to you about how to uh, make your code even better. You go through this arduous process to get legislative codes and regulations. Your competitors... They all do the same thing. Lexus, West, Bloomberg. It's like every vendor has to do this. Yeah. And this is the part that I think is crazy. You know, there's no competitive advantage to the text of the Georgia Code annotated, the official George Code of Georgia annotated, right? Everyone's going to have the same official Code of Georgia annotated, as they should. You know, the competition shouldn't be on the mere access. It should be what you can do to make the search experience smarter, easier. You know, what you can build on top of that that's useful to researchers, to journalists, to lawyers, to legal professionals. Um, and <laughs> instead of that, we have, uh, I think, five, six, eight vendors every night going to the same websites and crawling the same judicial opinions, the same acts from the Kentucky legislature, the same... Uh, in Louisiana insurance regulators website to pull down what's happened every day. Um, this is crazy. Now, I, I also think this is a place where states could help. If, if states, instead of saying we're going to post the document on the web and just leave it up to crawling, uh, if they said instead uh, we'll post it on the web, but we'll also create like a feed, uh, an update feed of these things, it would do a world of difference. I think many states sort of view publishing on the web as the end of the process. Their consumer is public access, and once the public has access to it, they sort of check the box in some sense. But as a publisher, I'll just say, it sure would be nice if uh, we didn't have to crash Pacer every night. <laughs> you know, if, if we could, if we could, you know, all sort of harvest these things in in a common way and. You wouldn't have to worry that a change in the underlying code might make you miss something, you know, and that's that's really hard. You think that this would be good for your industry if you weren't using the regulations as a competitive advantage, using the legislative codes as a competitive advantage? Do you think your industry will grow if the raw materials of our democracy are available in bulk for download by anybody? You're not worried about a bunch of ankle biters putting you out of business? Well, you know, I, I sort of maybe consider us still ankle biters. So um, I, I worry less about that. But let me just say, like, uh, if open access to the law is a threat to your business, you're in the wrong business. 
um, the whole idea is that these should be the raw materials with which you build. And access to the raw materials shouldn't be the differentiator, right? If, if, you're, if you're saying that the, the reason you should buy our house is because we're the only ones who have access to lumber, kind of makes you worry about the quality of the architecture of the house, doesn't it? So we don't need to create a monopoly in lumber to build beautiful houses, right? We can just say the, the underlying raw materials should be available to everyone in very high quality. And then people can build whatever beautiful things they want with that, with that lumber. So from, from our perspective, you know, at Fastcase, the, the whole idea, the whole goal of the company was to democratize the law. And so we are actively promoting entrepreneurs and new companies to work with this data. We've been partners with uh, many of the uh, kind of legal research startups that you've heard of in this industry, providing that data to them on a data feed basis. Uh, we've offered to um, the, the incumbents in the space, the traditional legal publishers, to make our feed available to them so they don't have to crawl the same sites every night. Just say, we'll do the crawling. There is no competitive advantage to our version of the Supreme Court opinion uh, versus yours. Uh, so, so from the from so the raw materials perspective, it should be available to everybody. Let's just take the legislative codes and regulations. Case law is sort of a different thing. Um, you've got a team that goes in and you, you crawl all the sites. You have to retype the things. You convert it to XML, which is what you provide to us once a quarter and to your commercial clients on a more frequent basis. How big an operation is that? Is, oh, it's huge. How many people? It's probably 100 people. Okay. Um, but we're spending millions of dollars a year. It's 100 people for all 50 states, and that includes your case law operation too, right? It's, I mean, uh, <laughs> it depends, right? When when the rest of the company is about, you know, 15 people uh, at some points in our history, <laughs> it felt very big. Your whole go find all the basic edicts of government operation is 100 people. You know, as we're a larger organization now, it feels more manageable. But um, it's interesting. It's even when we we're a very small company, we had this uh, kind of funny global integration. You know, we would turn the lights out in our offices in DC at eight o'clock at night, and they were turning the lights on in our offices in Handan, China, and Ting Um, And you know, they would work all day long. They would go visit thousands of websites and you know, go download everything that happened that day and harmonize it, format it, put it in XML, tag it. And then, you know, eight o'clock at night, they were delivering it back to us and turning the lights off there as we were turning the lights on in Washington, D.C., receiving on our doorstep, you know, a freshly bound package of yesterday's law. Um, it doesn't have to be that complicated. I, I think that it would be possible, maybe in, a, in our flying car future, uh, you know, 20 years from now, People will create the tools that will allow state governments to make that process easier. You're saying that especially given JSON and XML and SVG, they would need 100 people to digest this stuff? Yeah, or if they used a common format, right? If they all said, we're going to use this open XML format or even an open Microsoft Word format, right? I mean, just a, a text format that's common among all of them, it would make it easier. I'll just add, by the way, you know, there's there's a couple of companies who are working on this, um, Accenture and uh, Lexum, um, uh, the the kind of uh, software engine behind Canly, are are working on these kinds of tools for state governments who can automate their processes and create feeds and create them in standard data formats, which bless them. If the federal government were to do what you're doing, collect all the edicts of government and make them available, you think the state level that, that's a hundred person operation if the federal government were doing it. Obviously, some contractors and some staff. Does that sound about right? Or are you terribly more efficient than the government could ever be? You know, I, it's it's kind of hard to say. Like, um, I think it, uh, the government has some requirements that we don't. And so uh, to do it in the, you know, kind of the, the way the government is required to do it might be 50 percent more. Right? But we're talking about maybe 150 people, not. 1,500 people. 
Yeah, right? it would not be a giant operation. So maybe 150 to bootstrap it. And then over time, that number would go down. The government printing office, I, I, I'm sorry, government publications office. I always use the old fashioned name. Their GovInfo operation, which is the congressional record, the CFR, the reports, the Federal Register, the whole thing. That's about 40 people. That's about 20 GPO staffers and 20 contractors. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not completely out of reach. It wouldn't be hard for the government to do. And by the way, I'll say to people who are listening, uh, you and I have tried this a couple of times, right? To, to say, like, we will deliver to the government publication office, um, you know, a package of golden CD-ROMs with a canonical collection, right? Uh, or a thumb drive. Our offer was, if you look in the code of regulations and there's an image, it's typically a GIF file, maybe it's a PDF. And we've taken almost all those images in the CFR and reverse engineered them. Often, if you want to set a table in the code of federal regulations, uh, you do it in your word processing software and then you create a JPEG and that's what you include. We sent those all over to Digital Divide Data and Point B Studio and Inodata, and they turned them into accessible HTML. Uh, we've taken a lot of other diagrams and reverse engineered them into SVG graphics or MathML. We, we offered to give those back to the government. Again, government has special requirements. They want to verify that they were reverse engineered properly. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a recurring problem. Um, uh, another place that's coming up right now, uh, strangely, is emoji. So emoji are starting to appear in places like judicial opinions, maybe even codes as well. And uh, what's happening is they are born digital. They're sort of uh, rendered as emoji in Microsoft Word or in digital format. Then they are printed uh, into hardback tones in paper. Um, and, you know, often they're being converted to ASCII wingdings or something because you don't have the emoji character set in Times New Roman or whatever the book is being printed in uh, with data loss. And then, you know, people like Fastcase and many others are taking the paper and then scanning it, and then, you know, trying to recreate in digital what was born digital and then, you know, aliased and degraded for paper and it's a mess, right? If we could, if we could create a process that uh, allowed the government and state governments, federal governments, to work more closely with people who you know work with this data, public resource, and fast case, and others, Justia, um, in foreign digital formats, make the digital formats official formats. You know, do things like media neutral citations, so it doesn't matter what page of the Pacific Reporter it appears on uh, when you cite it. Uh, we can accomplish a lot, you know, and it, it's it's not, I think it's not for a lack of commitment to this process by government officials who are amazing. They're so passionate about this. I think it's just a matter of understanding where the problems are and understanding why a problem for a publisher might matter to a state. Thank you very much. Ed Walters from Fastcase. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thanks so much. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin.